Hello, today we will talk about designing observational studies, which can be done using electronic health record data. Just to start this off, I would like to, uh, to mention the CTSI board function, which includes statistics, epidemiology, and research design uh, services. Statistical support is provided by the School of Public Health at UWM, by the Statistics Consulting Service at MCW, and the Center for Advancing Population Science here at MCW. In order to receive our services, we encourage you to apply for BERT mini grants, which provide you with four to six hours of statistical support. This time can be used for defining project aims and discussing study design. In addition, we can review data, confirm the analysis, and provide um, sample size and power calculations. If more extensive statistical analysis is needed, please contact the Vice Statistics Consulting Service. Uh, that may include more advanced tasks such as designing and analyzing clinical trials, dealing with large databases, analyzing clinical and basic science data. We will be happy uh, to discuss um, ways of getting uh, the statistical support you need. Many MCW units and departments have integration contracts with us while other investigators pay for statistical consulting services from their personal grants. We will be happy to work with you on your projects, starting with the study design, all the way to the manuscript publishing. Okay, so now moving on to today's objectives. We will review most common observational study designs because observational studies are the most common type of scientific studies done using electronic health records. That includes cross-sectional studies, cohort studies, and case control studies. We will review reporting guidelines for the observational studies and discuss key considerations in designing such studies based on electronic health records, EHR. Analytic study design uh, depends on the objectives of clinical research. Many studies focus on identifying causes or risk factors for certain diseases or health-related outcomes. Others are aimed at evaluating the effectiveness of various treatments. The type of the study will depend on which objective you set. There are two broad types of analytical studies, interventional studies and observational studies. Interventional studies are the ones where patients receive certain treatment and then are observed for a specific outcome. The best known example of an interventional study is a classical randomized clinical trial. Observational studies usually involve um, a cohort of patients who are the focus of a given research project. For example, a cohort studies where patients who undergone bariatric surgery are identified and then followed for one year to understand the trajectory of their weight loss and quality of life. A very high percentage of currently published clinical and public health research is in the form of observational studies because there is a wealth of information that is collected and stored in registries, databases, and other data warehouses. Such data is readily available for research. So what should we look um, at before deciding on the study design? First of all, we look at the time scale which is used for the study. When we do a cross-sectional study, there is no temporal component. It is like a slice through the data at a given point in time. And we can look at where patients are um, at that particular point in time. This is a study which does not follow patients over time. Suppose we want to explore racial disparities in breast cancer screening. The investigator may focus on all patients newly diagnosed with breast cancer and evaluate information um, such as patients' race, ethnicity, receptor status, and the mode of diagnosis, self-detected versus screening mammography at the time when the diagnosis was made. In this case, the time point is well defined, and we take a cross-sectional look at all the patients which happen to be under observation. In prospective studies, we define the time origin where we will start observing patients' health journey, and then we follow them into the future. In contrast, retrospective studies are the ones where we look back at the subject's history. We identify all the patients of interest, some of whom already experienced the event, 
event we are studying and others who have not experienced such an event. Then we take a look back, trying to determine what might have predisposed certain patients to develop the event while others remain event free. Another important aspect of observational studies is a selection of patients. Um, as I mentioned, cross-sectional studies uh, involve patients evaluated at a single point in time. They are also commonly referred to as prevalence studies because they allow to estimate prevalence of a certain conditions in the study population. Cohort studies involve a group of patients monitored over time. They can be both retrospective or prospective in nature. Case control studies usually involve two groups of subjects, both with and without the outcome. Cases will be patients who are subjects who experience certain outcome, and controls will be those which do not have that outcome by a certain point in time. They identify at present time, and then we look backwards to see how different their exposures were. These studies are retrospective. So, going deeper into cross-sectional studies, uh, participants in this case are uh, uh, based on uh, a set of well-defined criteria. For example, patients who visit family de uh, medicine department in 2020 will be studied. It is a well-defined cohort. You take every patient who was seen in the clinic in a given year, and that forms your study cohort. The outcome and exposure in the study participants um, are measured at the same time, the current time. For example, we may look at the prevalence of eating disorders and want to examine its association with the patient characteristics. First of all, we want to know how many patients suffer from such a condition. Um, so uh, we can use these studies to estimate the prevalence of the outcome. Next, we want to know how it varies dependent on the patient's age, race, depression status, or its history. Cross-sectional studies is exactly the type of study which would allow us to do just that. Um, let's look at one example uh, of a cross-sectional study. The aim was to examine the prevalence of medical cannabis use according to confidential patient survey and to compare the prevalence of medical cannabis use documented in the EHR uh, with, the, with the patient report. The investigators performed a cross-sectional survey using a large healthcare system. The survey took place at the end of 2020 through 2021. Survey data was linked to the electronic health records data collected in the year before the screening. Um, Cannabis use. Around 1,700 patients responded to the survey. The primary uh, uh, care prevalence of uh, this past year patient reported cannabis use uh, from the survey was nearly 40%. The prevalence of EHR documented medical cannabis use was up about 5%. That's an example of cross-sectional studies where all the patients can be given um, in a given year uh, were assessed for two things. Uh, that includes self-reported cannabis uh, use, uh, which was uh, obtained using the survey, and cannabis use reported in their medical records. Um, this is also a good example of how electronic medical record can be used for research studies. Uh, subjects are selected based on a set of criteria and the data are collected on these subjects. In some cohort studies, patients are followed from diagnosis to certain clinical events, such as death or disease remission, disease recurrence. Some uh, cohort studies are retrospective studies. For example, we identify a cohort of patients who suffer from anorexia and adulthood, and we look at their past medical history, including childhood habits, onset of eating disorders, uh, their smoking history, drug usage, etc. Cohort studies are appealing in that they allow to evaluate multiple outcomes, such as development of diseases or other events, um, on the same cohort. That's a big advantage of these studies. It also allows us to evaluate the association between exposure and the outcome. Consider an example of a cohort study. 
the aim uh, was to characterize the effect of vaccination on long-term COVID. For this study, a cohort of patients who were sick with COVID-19 between 2021 through January of 2022 were identified. Uh, patients were identified based on uh, electronic health records uh, from 11 and NIH projects on uh, COVID. The outcome was long COVID defined by a certain ICD codes or a specific type of visit to a healthcare facility. Patient vaccination status was also evaluated based on electronic medical record. The findings included quantifying the risk of developing long COVID based on vaccination status. Uh, let's look at case control studies. Those are retrospective observational studies, which are used to determine if there is an associ association between the risk factors and the outcome of interest. Cases are usually identified based on the outcome status. For example, we identify teenagers who are diagnosed with anorexia seen at their primary uh, care physician or a certain clinic in 2022. Controls are similar uh, subjects who do not have the outcome and were seen in, in the clinic at the same time. In this example, um, uh, controls would be uh, subjects which do not have the, con the condition. Uh, then we are looking at the uh, previous exposures, so previous risk factors, which may be associated with developing anorexia. This design uh, allows us to develop multiple exposures as risk factors for a single outcome. It is not that common to hear term case control study when referring to a prospective study where cases and controls are defined uh, as patients having or not having certain baseline characteristics. Both groups are followed to examine the occurrence of a particular outcome. In both cases, whether it's retrospective or prospective case uh, control study, case and controls may be matched on some characteristics to minimize confounding uh, um, and the effect of other characteristics of the outcome. Matching is often done within uh, goal of uh, making the populations that are being compared, cases and controls, similar in some sense. If the two groups are similar with respect to all characteristics except for the treatment they receive, it is assumed, it is assumed that the differences seen in their outcome may be attributed to the treatment, not to the differences between the groups. There's a host of questions that come along. What characteristics should we match on? how many controls to select in each case, and how to select those controls among all possible matches. Can controls be reused? If so, should we match uh, individuals uh, with the replacement or without re a replacement among controls? First of all, we have to decide uh, which variables to match. Matching is often done on risk factors predictive of the outcomes. Um, and whose effect on the outcome is not of interest. We may also want to match in variables which are hard to adjust for, for example, geographical, environmental factors, details, disease type. On the other hand, we should not match on characteristics that we want to evaluate in terms of the outcomes, because if all the cases and controls will be matched on such characteristics, there will be no variability in them, and we will not be able to see that some of them predispose patients to become cases uh, by experiencing an adverse outcome more frequently. We don't match um, on intermediate outcomes, which can stand on causal path, a pathway to the outcome. And we shouldn't uh, be overmatching because that will make uh, it very hard to find proper matching for um, each case that we are studying. Also, if there is no natural matching criteria, there's no need to match. Uh, there are other ways we can adjust for uh, uh, the similarities between groups, such as regression methods. When we select controls, uh, we typically uh, select several controls for each case. Having more controls per case increases statistical power. Um,
When we select controls, we typically do it by selecting several controls for each case. Having more controls per case increases statistical power. However, there is a ceiling after which there is no clear benefit of having more matches. Matching with the ratio of 1 to 3 or 1 to 4 is quite reasonable. It leads to good statistical power and makes matching feasible. Number of matches may vary. If the goal is to find four match controls for every case, it is possible that some cases will only be matched to two or three controls, and that's to be expected. There are several ways of finding a match. First of all, there are different ways of defining what a good match is, and there are appropriate processes to select such matches. Now, should we sample controls with replacement or without replacement? There is no general consensus on that. In general, each case defines a population where appropriate matching uh, controls may overlap. So there might be several cases which are in need of very similar controls. For example, several cases are of the same age, gender, and disease stage and would be in need of such controls. If not using the controls and doing matching without replacement, the order of selecting controls matters as it can introduce bias. If we are using controls, uh, we can end up with one control being assigned to several cases. And that requires a statistical adjustment when doing the analysis. Let's look at some examples of case control studies. In this case, the objective was to identify breast cancer characteristics associated with the higher likelihood of COVID. In this study, women um, who have breast cancer were treated at MCW in a certain year, and they were selected to participate in the study. Controls were women who did have breast cancer, but did not have COVID in the same time frame. They were matched with the ratio of one to four where each case was matched with three controls. And the matching was done on the following risk factors, race, BMI, diabetes status, residing in Milwaukee County versus suburbs. That resulted in 25 patients matched with 75 controls. Then the patient characteristics were compared between the cases and controls. And to adjust for matching, conditional logistic regression was used to identify risk factors associated with developing COVID. It was found that active chemotherapy was significantly associated with an increased risk of developing COVID. Patients who uh, were undergoing chemotherapy had uh, six times higher odds of having COVID as compared to patients who were not undergoing chemotherapy at the time. Another example of case control study illustrates the setup where cases and controls are defined at the baseline, not based on the outcome. This study aimed to compare early results of open and, um, and the vascular management of artery uh, aneurysm. There are 59 cases were under vascular repair and 250 cases with open repair. A one-to-one -one matching was done on the baseline demographic clinical and anatomical covariates that resulted in 56 match pairs. So all the three cases were able to find a match among the open repair controls. The outcome being studied was a need for the re-intervention and there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups in terms of this outcome. So what are the statistical considerations we should have in mind when analyzing observational data? Most statistical techniques used to analyze observational data are based on the following idea. The change in outcome that is um, uh, specifically associated with the risk factor or treatment uh, which is being evaluated while holding all the factors constant. So what are the statistical considerations we should have in mind when analyzing observational data? Most statistical techniques used to analyze observation data um, are based on the following idea. The change in outcome that is specifically associated with the risk factor or treatment uh, is evaluated while holding all other factors constant. If everything is the same and only the treatment, 
or a single copy, the difference between subjects being compared. We attribute the difference in the outcome um, to differences in treatment or the covariate being analyzed. The interpretation of the association between the risk factor and the outcome from such analysis is conditional on or adjusted for other factors. The control for other risk factors can be achieved in two ways. We can do either aggression adjustment or matching. And these are the two most common statistical analysis techniques used to analyze observational data. Let's touch upon STROBE guidelines. STROBE stands for strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology. They provide standards similar to those that apply to randomized clinical trials and should be followed in observational studies. Observational studies may be biased because patients are not randomly are selected uh, to receive one uh, treatment versus another or randomly assigned into groups. But it is best to acknowledge that and develop a plan of action when the study is being planned. Observational studies without statistical analysis plan look like um, fishing expeditions, often involving large number of statistical tests, which increases uh, the likelihood of type one error and they tend to report on the significant findings. When reporting for an observational study, we should always describe the scientific methods used in great detail. That includes describing the study settings, such as location, dates, exposure, length of follow-up, or type of follow-up, and data collection mechanisms. Uh, then we describe the sample size. This may include an explanation how the sample size was estimated in the planning stages. Often, the sample size will be driven by the aim of achieving adequate power to detect the differences which, are, which we are interested in. It is not just the sample size that is important. The sum, subject sampling procedure has to be scientifically sound as well. We have to ensure a representative sample um, and control for potential biases. It is extremely important for all studies, including observational studies. Um, and forming a cohort based on electronic health record poses additional challenges, which we'll, we'll discuss on the next uh, slide. When we uh, design a study based on electronic health records and we consider study participants, we should have in mind the type of the study. For example, for a cohort study, we have to have clearly defined eligibility criteria. We have to define sources and methods for selecting the study participants. We have to describe the follow-up method and follow-up time frame because it's important to have adequate follow-up for assessing the outcomes. Similar aspects have to be considered in designing a case control study. However, in this case, we have to clearly distinguish who the cases and who the controls are and how we will identify them. We have to make sure that the information for the feature that distinguishes between cases and controls is being collected in an adequate manner. That's especially true for sourcing them based on electronic medical records. Also, we have to make sure that cases and controls have similar follow-up. If we are doing a match study, we have to define matching criteria and identify the number of individuals who can serve as cases and controls. Cross-sectional studies um, uh, also require clear definition of eligibility criteria after which the sources and methods for selecting participants are considered. After uh, we decided who will we collect data on, we need to decide what data will be collected and analyzed. Uh, we have to give consideration to the variable and data sources. Uh, first, we define primary and secondary outcomes. We have to identify what constitutes an exposure and uh, risk factors that we want to study. That includes potential predictors, confounders, effect modifiers that can be encountered in the study. For each variable of interest, we have to have in mind where we will get the data and how it is being measured. When it's being measures, measured and check if that record is available in the data set or data source we will be using. We have to describe the data uh, base we utilize for retrieving the data. 
uh, data sources vary from small Excel data sheets where patient information is manually retrieved from uh, their medical charts to very large databases, which are maintained by consortiums where data is entered by qualified data managers and the databases are maintained by large IT teams. Electronic health records are also a very rich data resource, but we have to describe how they will be used to fit the needs of our study. Once we give serious consideration to the data and we know that the, what data will be available, we start thinking about the data analysis plan. Statistical analysis plan involves the specification of methods for analyzing primary and secondary outcomes. Often, post hoc analysis get performed. Those are the analyses that are done to answer questions raised after seeing the data. We also have to give some thought to testing data, and this is the topic which is now more and more relevant when submitting papers to high impact journals. There's a variety of ways on how to address missing data. Uh, even in study planning stages, we have to recognize that some missing data may be present and consider what we will do about that. The amount of missing data may depend on the type of the study. For example, in clinical trials, we have fewer uh, data points which are missing, while in observational studies, which re rely on registries, electronic health records, uh, missing data can be present at a much higher rate. Another indicator of data quality is patient follow-up. For example, if we have patients who need to be followed up for five, seven, or ten years to see a certain outcome uh, develop, uh, we have to make sure that we have enough follow-up to make valid conclusions. Therefore, it's important to address the follow-up question and adequately plan for it. For any study that has uh, that uh, has been done, we have to describe how good and how comprehensive the follow-up on the study cohort was. So all of that relates to the electronic health records. So when we look at electronic data uh, records, uh, they are usually longitudinal data, which is incorporated into every healthcare organization. The documentation of health and services is stored um, along with the demographic, diagnostic, procedural, therapeutic, and lab test data collected during routine healthcare. Why is it so appealing for research? First of all, we generate large data set on real patient populations, which can be monitors almost, monitored almost in real time. It's easy to retrieve because these days we can just get the data exported in a format which is uh, conveniently uh, used for biomedical research. Using EHR is time and cost efficient because the data is already sitting there. In that they are different uh, from, let's say, clinical trials, which take years to complete and are very expensive. Therefore, electronic health records provide a way to uh, conduct medical studies and answer research questions in a very time efficient and cost efficient manner. So how do we use electronic health records for observational research? Electronic health records can be used as a standalone data source or can be linked to other databases. Remember the example uh, at the beginning of this talk where, talk where we looked at the cannabis use and uh, there was a survey which was done in current time and data collected from the survey was linked to the patient's medical record to see if the reports uh, are similar. Um, it can be also used to support natural history studies, which usually focus on diagnosis, treatment patterns, and outcomes. It enables us to see which treatments are used most commonly to treat the condition being studied, what, cow what outcomes that leads to. They can also provide data for safety studies and health services research. EHR can be even used for broad drug post-marketing surveillance. Clinical trials are needed to get approval for new treatments, and that involves clinical trials from phase one to phase three. But post-marketing studies involve everybody who, take the med who takes the medication of interest uh, or uses the medical device, and we can observe them for uh, efficacy, but especially for uh, adverse events. The EDHR can be a wonderful source for such follow-up. While EHR can be used for prospective clinical research, currently 
the EHR used for clinical trials is very limited. Nonetheless, EHR can serve as a screening tool when um, a clinic is considering participation in a clinical trial. For example, looking at the medical records will allow us to get a rough estimate of the number of patients who would be available or would qualify for a trial which is being planned. EHR can also be used in pragmatic trials, which are designed to evaluate the effectiveness of various interventions in real-life practice settings. Critical trials provide valuable information on treatment effectiveness on a carefully selected homogeneous patient group. But once the treatment gets approved and used by more people, we may want to shift focus on studying what happens in real-life situations. While the data is readily available for the retrieval from electronic health records, transforming EHR into a data set is not a simple task. We have to be very careful about selecting study participants, defining baseline, and collecting baseline information. Caution should be used when defining the follow-up for future outcomes because medical records are available for patients starting at various stages of their health journey. Some come to a healthcare provider very frequently, while others are seen very infrequently. That all affects on how we define the baseline for the study we want to do and the follow-up time frame. We should not forget that electronic health records um, only include patients So when we select research participants, it's important to define inclusion and exclusion criteria, which can be applied post hoc versus when specifying inclusion criteria in observational studies. This can be complex and may require developing a set of rules or an algorithm on how certain cases will be identified and how we will select patients who will be enrolled in the study. We should not forget that electronic health records only include patients who have interactions with healthcare organizations. So when we look at them, we have to realize that we will be seeing just certain people or patients who are in the system. It is known that about 50% of US populations ha population has no contact with healthcare system in any given year. So either they never see a physician or they see physicians very infre infrequently, and that may have implications for generalizing the findings. For example, let's say if you take a patient who saw the healthcare provider in a given year, maybe they're sicker. Maybe they have a chronic condition and that's why they are seen by the provider. Maybe just the opposite. Maybe they're healthier. Uh, maybe there are people who are serious about their annual checkups, about getting regular tests and see a provider for that reason. We have to be careful when identifying patients based on EHR, not to introduce bias in the study population. Now, it's important to give some thought to information quality, which is available as it applies to EHR data. EHR records are not always correct. They may contain wrong diagnosis codes, incorrect procedure codes or dates. They have errors in reporting lab results, things like that. And this is a concern for everybody doing medical research based on EHR, but it's something that's very hard to address. Read other records in EHR. It's possible that a patient comes from a different hospital just for follow-up care in a given institution whose records we are seeing. It's possible that a patient received initial part of the treatment at the hospital uh, whose records we have, but then went home or a clinic closer to their home for follow-up care and more routine visits. In cases like these, patient follow-up information is lost because it's very infrequently that two databases or two healthcare systems interact. We can think about workarounds for this or a compromise to alleviate these problems. For example, one may consider including only patients who receive continuous care for their problem or those who were seen for at least two years in a row in a given institution. Such requirements as receiving primary care services through a particular health care organization are quite common uh, to be included in the study. So they don't just come for, sp for specialty care, but all their care, including primary care services, 
uh, is housed in that hospital. Uh, baseline information is important in every study. How do we define the baseline? For prospective studies, we have to come up with a clear definition of the study starting. For example, the date of diagnosis or time of surgery or other medical procedure. In this case, baseline information collection is well defined and can be executed well. EHR provides unequally spaced var uh, variable quality information pieces spanning from the first to the last encounter documented in the EHR. So how do we establish the baseline date? It can be anything between the first and the last uh, EHR documented encounter. You probably want to choose the time point closest to the uh, earliest EHR documented encounter, which is related to your study, because that will allow you to maximize the follow-up time. Allowing some time before the index encounter may provide you richer baseline information. It is common to require six months to two years of pre-baseline um, encounter information in EHR-based studies. For example, you set up patients who underwent cancer treatment here. You look at all the patients who were diagnosed with cancer and then received subsequent treatment here. You will want to include only patients who have, say, a year worth of data before diagnosis time and received primary care in our institution. Uh, that's one way to arrange a, a good study cohort. After the cohort is formed, we consider collection of the baseline information. In this step, we should look uh, for opportunity for information. Uh, that's uh, the col a collection of uh, pre-baseline encounters uh, that may provide usable research information, and that can be achieved by using the six to 12 months required uh, window prior to enrolling patients into the study. When collecting the baseline information, opportunity for information is frequently expressed in units of time or number of encounters. It is usually expressed as the time interval or the number of encounters between the first and the baseline encounter. This will be variable between the patients, and we have to set some rules on which patients should be included in the study. Patients with greater opportunity for information may have more opportunity for documentation of a medical problem. Clinicians here regularly within the last five years, you have more chances of reporting that they had a certain infection or a specific illness. Such a diagnosis may not be recorded for patients who are not seeking medical care at the hospitals uh, whose records uh, are being used for a particular research study. Incorporating whole available uh, pre-baseline uh, factor information is uh, preferable to a fixed pre-baseline time interval. Assessing association between two factors whose assessment depends on the opportunity for information window might be a problem. Often confounding adjustment methods may help to alleviate this problem. When we look for uh, certain characteristics for determining the presence or absence of qualitative characteristics or values for quantitative characteristics, we need rules that work well for majority. R the rules will not be perfect, and they may not apply for everybody. But as long as they're applicable for 99% of the patients, it's good enough. So some imperfections in the rules may need to be tolerated in the electronic health record-based research. Usually these data sets are very large and cannot be reviewed manually. So how do we create rules like that? For example, if you decide that you will select patients based on uh, BMI into the study and you see that the BMI for a particular patient is 200, you know that something was recorded incorrectly, perhaps patient's height or uh, weight. And instead of manually reviewing multiple charts, which would be prohibitively time consuming, you just decide that if BMI exceeds 100 or is less than 10, you will not consider those patients for inclusion. Let's discuss some imperfections of the qualitative data in HR based records. For example, if we are looking at a binary characteristics, we usually are getting just positive affirmation for defining disease present or, or certain condition. The absence of it doesn't mean that the disease is absent. 
it's the sense that we don't see a positive contribution confirmation because the HR uh, data rarely could, uh, contains negative confirmations such as documenting that disease was tested for and not found. So given the diagnosis dependence and opportunity for information that was just discussed, uh, EHR-based uh, studies often will result in condition label as absence just because it was not tested for or was not examined for. That's a limitation we all have to understand when dealing with binary outcomes uh, in electronic health records. Now, while we are looking at quantitative data, HR has a clear strength by having every lab result, every vital sound taken being stored in the database. When we want to retrieve quantitative data, which constitutes our baseline measurements, we have to also define the rules, the rules on uh, uh, which the measurements uh, will be taken. For example, value measured at the baseline date. If that's not available, we probably should consider closest measurement prior to the baseline date. In some cases, it might be appropriate to take the measurement closest to the time after the baseline. The latter may not be applicable in some studies, however. For example, let's say we want to study the quality of life over the course of cancer treatment. The value uh, or the measurement of quality of life before the treatment started is our true baseline assessment. But you cannot use the assessment after the treatment started um, as the baseline assessment because patient condition can be deteriorating due to toxicity. Data missingness in quantitative data is not uncommon. When we deal with missing data in medical records, there are rarely, uh, these data are rarely missing at random. This is an important assumption for statistical considerations of missing data, because many imputation techniques are based on the assumption that the data is missing at random. Missing data can be associated with being in better health. Patients who are healthy uh, that come to see a physician infrequently will have more missing data. Patients who are sick will have more frequent visits to the healthcare provider with every visit providing additional information. Serious consideration has to be given to missing data and missingness patterns when dealing with electronic health records. The last, next issue uh, which we should consider is outcome tracking in EHR. When we look at the medical records and we identify the baseline or the starting point for the study, the outcome tracking is pass passive. We just see what happens for the patient between the baseline visit and the last documented encounter or death. Completeness of the outcome assessment will depend on many factors out of which continuity of care at the same institution is one of the most important ones. Medical record timeline assessment is also subject to the rules we create. Remember that the rules have to work for a majority, not necessarily for every single patient. The rules we create have to ensure that the data is adequate and make its collection feasible. For example, we may assume that patients are evaluatively tracked for study outcomes within the entire follow-up period, and the absence of an EHR-documented study outcome equates to the absence of the outcome. Um, such uh, assumptions or simplified um, conditions are necessary to conduct EHR studies. To illustrate how the HR uh, selection rules may be implemented, let's look at the study of the vaccination effect on, on long COVID. COVID-19 index date was uh, defined as the earliest reported indication of COVID-19 infection. Individuals who met the following inclusion criteria were eligible for the study. They had to have an ICD code for COVID-19 uh, diagnosis or a positive test during the study period. There were all adults at the time of diagnosis, and then they either had completed or not started um, uh, COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, they also um, have to have reported uh, had to have a reported healthcare visit three months to approximately one year after the index date, and they had to have at least two reported healthcare visits in the year prior to being diagnosed with COVID-19. 
you can see how these inclusion criteria leverage GHR to make sure that patients with peer eligibility criteria are included in the study cohort. And the receipt of care after the index visit ensures that they were followed up after the index visit in order to adequately assess the outcome. Um, so, results generated from EHR studies look highly credible because of high, uh, very precise results derived from these large sample sizes. However, they, they can be biased. The goal should be identifying the most informative patients from the medical uh, record database without compromising generalizability. Maximizing data completeness may lead to overselection of healthy or less healthy individuals. Selecting patient population who receive primary care services through the EHR organization uh, within the study's inclusion criteria may address the completeness concerns. Confounding and missing data are very important issues when planning studies using electronic health records. Um, and while the EHR provides longitudinal data, one has to be very careful not to use future data in predictive modeling. This goes back to survival analysis principles, which state that at the time when we predict what happens to the patient, we only use the data which is available up to that point. The health care documented in EHR uh, changes over time as new test or procedures are adopted and published evidence requires changes in medical practice. EHR infrastructure is also evolving to accommodate more or different records. That brings my presentation to conclusion. Uh, these are some references which can be helpful in reading more about observational studies and in particular those are, uh, which are based on electronic health record data. Some of the information from these articles uh, were used for the presentation. Thank you.